Well, hello everyone. We are so happy that you've joined us today. We continue the conversation about racism. Today is about helping all of us to understand, to educate, to bring unity, and to stop the division, to bring hope. And we know that hope is Jesus. God gave me a verse for those of you who don't know our whole story, but when I was 15 years old, John 10, 10 was a verse God gave me that has become the theme of my life, and it's why we're here today. He said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you can have life and life to the full. So in this conversation we're about to have, we won't say everything right. We, we, we won't say enough for some people. We will say too much for other people. But the fact is, we just can't keep silent, right? So I'm asking all of us, and we have a live audience with us today in the room. We're social distanced, of course. But I'm asking all of you to give us grace as we open our hearts and open up this huge topic, more than a topic, this real struggle about racism. I want to welcome to the stage the people that are here and introduce them and let them tell you a little bit about themselves. Take a moment. On my right is Jarvis Parsons and his wife Amy and Aaron, their daughter, been here. Tell us who you are, a little bit about how you came to Skybreak. So I'm Jarvis. Uh, we have been here almost 18 years now. We came by and I looked at the church on the website and we had drove by the church and um, I told my wife before, I said, I want to go, let's go to a multicultural church. She said, okay, that's good. I said, no, I want to go to a church where there are black people. And she's like, okay, that's good. I said, no, I want to go where there are black people from Bryan and College Station. And so she's like, what is the big deal? I was like, I said, there's a difference. I said, I want to know that people have a choice where they want to go and they choose to go here. They choose to go here. I said, there's a big difference. And for me at the time, and I was young, and uh, but I said that was important to me. And so when we walked in that one, that one time, we came on Giving Sunday uh, 17 years ago, and we had no money. We had about 50 cents in our pockets. And uh, they were like, come on up to the front. And we're like, we ain't got no money. We have no money. Uh, but, uh, but no, it's been really good. It's been really, really good. And so it's like you, how you say, it's our family of choice. And so we choose to be here um, because God is here and we have relationships here. Well, Amy is uh, white. We met in college, um, and uh, that was kind of one of these interesting deals here was that uh, for a long time, her parents and my parents were not too keen on the idea um, for a lot of different reasons, um, but God worked in the middle of that, how we um, stayed together from me moving up and down the East Coast um, to getting married and how our family is so much stronger now. And we have a daughter that is Erin um, and who is now 11. I believe she's grown up in this church. This is the only church she's ever known. Um, and so, yeah, so we we love it here. Beautiful. Yeah. And he's also our district attorney. Yes, I do that Brazos too. Brazos County. That's, do his, that too. that's his job. <laughs> so fantastic. To my left, Mikado Henson. Man, I'm so glad to have you, Mikado, and your wife's here on the front row, and your son. Yes, sir. We moved to, my name is Mikado. We moved to College Station, Bryan College Station, in 2014 after taking a job with the Texas a football team. And uh, one thing that really appealed to us about coming to Skybreak Church was, yes, the diversity. We were desiring to find a church home that was going to look like heaven. And we wanted to be able to worship, have that worship experience on earth before we get to heaven, yeah. where there'd be many ethnicities and many people from different places. And, and, and so that's been a, a great joy and a privilege of ours to be able to be a part of this church. Um, my wife, Chandra, my daughters, Maya, Kendall, and, and my son, MJ, uh, we've been here six years and it has been an honor and it's a joy to be able to walk alongside people of this church and in this community and to be able to point people to Jesus Christ. Absolutely. I'm so glad you and your family are here. We've become friends. Yes, sir. And glad to have you joining us today. All right, I want to jump right in. Uh, racism is a sin. And it's a problem. And it's wrong. Now, some people say, 
well, well, I don't have a problem with racism. I mean, I've had people say that. Well, I don't have a problem with racism. And I heard someone express it this way. This is like pollen. There's, there's a problem, but unless you have allergies, you don't know there's a problem. <laughs> there, there's a problem, but unless you're a person of color, you don't really know there's a problem or even how uh, to address the problem. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God and love people as you love yourself. There's probably a reflection here as to why racism is so huge is that a lot of people don't know how to love themselves. They're not happy with who they are. Therefore, they can't love other people. And then they don't know how to love God. So we don't know how to love others because they only know how to love ourselves. So that's what we're supposed to do, those love God, love others and ourselves. And, and what does that look like? And we're a diverse church here at Skybreak. We can't talk about our diversity unless we talk about the disparity. So I want to discuss, if you guys would help me, some of the prejudices that we're facing today. You made a statement the other day to me to start believing the experiences that people have. And, and you made a comment. You said black voices vary. They're not all monolithic. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about some of that? Just, just unpack, yeah. go, go with that. If you so will. the first thing I was, um, I think for the first time, we're talking about George Floyd right now. And people are like, wow. Oh my gosh. And some people are coming to the table and saying, I can't believe this happened. And somebody on Twitter or Facebook made a, a, a statement and I thought it was very good. It said, um, racism isn't getting worse, it's getting filmed. Mm. And when they said that, mm. I was like, yes. Wow. That's exactly what it is. I said, for so many times, people, when they say, when, when people would say something had happened, yep. And they, many times you have people who don't know how to even describe what has happened to them. People say, well, maybe it's not this. Or maybe you thought about this. Or did you think about it this way? Or you may have, you may have misperceived X, Y, and Z. Yep. But what you're starting to see more with the advent of cell phones and cameras is, and especially with George Floyd, is that you couldn't look away. And what I think happened is you see so many people who are so who are angry and they're hurt is not just because George Floyd, what happened to George Floyd, it is George Floyd was my uncle, mm -hmm. he was my cousin, he was my church member, yeah, he right. was my mom who couldn't say anything right. because they were afraid to lose their job mm -hmm. yeah. or lose, uh, lose, lose some sort of status. They had to take those indignities for so long and those stories for many people, they've been passed on in families but they couldn't talk about them until there's these big eruptions in our, in our uh, societal fabric. And so for me it is one of the ways to understand that is to start believing people when they talk to you about what's going on. Just start, start by believing. Something else you said Jarvis that was powerful to me is I wanna know what's being said when we deal with racism yeah, you know, and, and and people say, "Well, I'm not, I'm not racist." Not but racist, what's yeah. being said when you're not there, you're not present? So yes, we were talking about that, and I, I when I said it, I mean, what I want to talk about is, for many people who are white, you have the ability to live in two different worlds. You have the world where you go to, you can go to. You can live wherever you want to live. You can choose to live around diverse people or choose not to live around diverse people. That's totally, or, or go to work and work in a place that is all white. You, can, you, you have that ability. Um, at the same time, being a black person in America, sometimes you, we have no choice but to be in what many times people call white spaces. And you may have a friend who is, you know, who is, who is black or who is Hispanic, and you can act one way with them and act another way when you're around your friends or around your other family. Right. So when jokes are said and things like that, that you just kind of laugh off. And so for me, what are you going to say when I'm not there? Right. What are you going to tolerate when I am not there? Are you going to stand up for me when I am not there? When you hear the jokes, when you're at work with the supervisors and things like that, and you know that something's wrong go that's going on, are you going to stand up for me or the other person that's there right. that can't speak for themselves, that may have no idea what's going on? And that's huge for me. It's like, okay, so stand up for me when Powerful. I'm not there. Yes. So. 
very powerful. And especially the part about the, the white person can choose, you can choose yes. where the, the, some of the culture we're going to live in, mm -hmm. whereas what you just said was, that's news. See, I, I, didn't, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. And I think that's the powerful part of a conversation like this is it's allowing us to recognize some things that we maybe we're just naive to. Right. And uh, so I want to talk about white privilege. And I want to ask you guys to speak to that. I'm white. Uh, we heard. In case you didn't know. <laughs> um, but white privilege. I, I actually have to say, when I first heard that s phrase or that, those two words together, I'm like, well, my, my grandparents, my, both my granddads were blue collar workers. They struggled their whole life to make a living, feed their families, large families, lots of kids, and, you know, blue collar background. And my dad never went to college. He just, he just, worked hard I mean that was my logic right I'm like let's well, worked hard I mean that w I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth kind of that was the thought right and, and I but but when I really begin to find out what white privilege means um and I'm still learning so help us with that Macaulay would you like to t talk to us a little bit about white privilege and explore so for example things like Jim Crow laws or redlining a lot of people don't know what redlining is right. at all. What do you mean redlining? And is that a movie? You know, what, but, but explaining some of that, that. I know. So talk about that. Yeah. Um, you know, you can go through and find a, a list of things that would fall under, you know, things that historically white people could do and black people for a long time could not do, right, until certain laws and things were passed. Um, but you look back to the beginning of our country, the whole life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. At one point, black people weren't viewed as a full human being. Right, right. And so a lot of people say the system is broken. The system really isn't broken. The system was set up not to work for certain people. And so there has been a privilege in the undertones just of how things were set up with the writing of the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, those types of things, with certain people weren't considered. And so it does not have to do with, you know, my parents are blue collar, you know, shoot, they could, my, my dad was a farmer and things like that. It has nothing to do with that, but it has to do with the way society and the system has been set up, right? You think about it like this, here's a great privilege. You have, black men and women, white men and women who go serve in the military in war. Well, back in World War II and even the Vietnam War, they could take the same bullet on the battlefield, but would come home and couldn't drink from the same water fountain as white people. And someone might argue and say, well, these laws were overturned in 1964, Jim Crow right. law, whatever, but the undertone and the, right. the, the, the widespread yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if under, there's a better word than under. It's still, there's, there's still a, a racism. Yeah, there's an Did, undercurrent. You didn't outlaw racism. I mean, That's right. When, pe when it's been deeply ingrained and it's passed on from generation to generation to generation, no law can set you free from that. No. The law can allow me to drink from the same water fountain, sit wherever I want on a bus, right. eat at any restaurant or That's sleep in right. any hotel, not have to go through a green book, another thing to study in educational history, um, that's the law, but it's the human heart that is struggling, and it's the 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 the, the layers and generations right. of that sin that you, that we call racism. Right. Yep. That people who have had a mindset of superiority and and people of color are inferior. Right. And it has just been that way as far as the way the system has been set from the beginning. So, um, you know, me personally, I'm biracial, right? So my parents have been married 49 years. And it, it was just amazing some of the things that they have experienced along the way. Um, yeah, so talk us about, yeah. tell us about that. We didn't mention that a while ago. Right. Your parents just celebrated 51 years? 49. 49 years yes, of marriage. That's where the hand clap, everybody, right there. Yeah. 49 yeah. Uh, And got married in the 60s. He is African American and she's Caucasian. Yeah, my mom graduated in the early 70s. Got, my mom graduated high school May of 71. They got married June 6th of 71. Wow. 
the beautiful thing about that is that my grandparents, my mom's parents, my grandma and grandpa Tower, they loved my dad from the beginning. My parent, my dad's parents, uh, Shirley and Silas Henson, they loved my mom from the beginning. There are five boys and five girls in my dad's family. All five, my dad and my four uncles are all married to white women. Wow. So you come to a family reunion, it's a whole bunch of <laughs> biracial Mikados running around. It's a beautiful thing, right? Awesome. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. But they went through it. Absolutely. They went through Man. it. My brother and I, God growing up, knows. being born in the 70s, growing up in the 80s, we went through it. The identity of I'm too light to be considered black, I'm yeah. too dark to be considered white. Yeah. And so the identity issues, but I did come to the conclusion that I will always be viewed as non-white. Mm. Even though mm. I am half white, mm. very proud of who I am, who my mom is and who my dad is. But the way society looks at me through a lens, I am always viewed as non-white. Man. Unfortunately, it has, the question is always posed, what are you? And for some people, that, that means nothing to you. But when you're asked that question weekly, most of your teenage and adult life, you get pretty tired of answering what you are. But I've had situations of having to explain what I am. And then when I respond of saying, you know, that's kind of rude to ask. Well, I'm not offended if you ask me. Okay, what are you? I'm just white. Okay. How many times do you have to answer that? How often does someone yep. ask you what you are? Yep. They never do. Yep. My point exactly. So there is just an, and that's a small, there's an under, just undertones of privilege of the exhaustion of having to explain who you are, what your makeup is. All those types of things. So at the end of the day, um, there is a privilege. And unless you see it, right. you don't notice it. I've said it like this. Living in Bryan College Station, we're all Aggies, most of us, right? The, the majority color here is maroon and white. Maroon and white is worn by so many people, you don't even notice that people wear it anymore. Until someone walks up with burnt orange on, and then you automatically look at them different. Yeah. And you begin, listen, right. you begin to demonize them right. because they don't have the same color as you. Right. Yep. And so yep. they so are true. a minority in a so majority true. culture, right. Right. right? And so at the end of the day, so you're true. like, you don't take time to get to know them. You don't know their history, their background, things mm. like that. Prejudge. You prejudge, mm. prejudge. right? Be and then there's a privilege of wearing yeah. these colors. Yep. And you don't look like me, so you're, you're an outcast or you're bad or you're not given the same... Privilege. When yep. you were talking about privilege, I think this is interesting because I want to marry two statements. The first is um, those GIs that came back. The white GIs, from my understanding, got a chance to go to college on the GI Bill. And those black vets who got those same bullets did not get a chance to raise their station in life. And so one of the things that you said a long time ago, I remember was good, is that as parents, our goal is to make our children, have our children stand on our shoulders so they could see farther Absolutely. and go farther than yep. we ever did. Yep. And when I talk to my dad, who my dad didn't, my dad is not, was born in 1952, and he talks to me about integrating, when he integrated, it was his senior year in school, and the books that he had that were 20 years older that had pages ripped out of them, the, the equipment that they had for band. He, he got a scholarship in band and went to, went to school because he was a gifted drummer. Um, but he was, he said, I was so behind in school wow. when, I, when we integrated because I was like, we didn't know, we were 20 years behind. Our stuff was awful compared. So if he's trying to do his best to put me on his shoulders, right. but his shoulders had been slumped over. Yeah. Right? Wow. How far are you at a disadvantage? Think and so about it. when we talk about privilege, it doesn't mean that people didn't, didn't have it hard because a lot of people had it hard. What it means is, is that your skin color was not a reason you had it hard. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yep. And, so, and yep. so that was for so many people. So one of the books I'm reading right now is called A Warmth of Other Suns. I just started it and it's an anthology and it goes back and it's talking about um, from 1915 to 1970, the migration of African Americans out of the South into the North and the reasons why, and the stories that I never learned mm -hmm. in high school or elementary school about the Tulsa race, the, the Tulsa massacre, Black about 
we have Black Wall Street, about Rosewood, about the people who were hanged, right? And how that terror, essentially, that can, you don't have to do that a bunch of times to make sure that people stay where you think they need to be. That's right. You only have to do that a couple of times That's so right. that people know that I can only go so far. Right. And I'm going to tell my children, don't, I love you too much to have you risk that right there. And yep. so that is a legacy mm. that's there that we never talk about. Mm. So when people talk about we need to know our history, we do need to know our history. Right. Mm. All of our history, oh, the so, good and so the true. bad, so that we are not doomed to repeat it. And, and mm. my wife and I took a trip to Washington, D.C. and went to the, uh, the National Bible Museum. Mm. And one of the exhibits they had was the slave Bible. So you even take that back to slavery, that the slaves were given a different Bible than the slave, the masters and their families had. And so there was over 80% of the Bible was removed, but everything that justified slavery, slaves obey your masters, the entire book of Exodus was missing because it talked about how freedom. you are now free. Freedom. Right, freedom. And so everything that the slaves were taught was oppression. You're, you're to be oppressed, and that is that honors God. And so part of that privilege was that the blacks were not given the entire Bible. And the Bible that they got taught that oppression and what slaves and math, that, that was all God's plan. Yeah. And that's all you knew and all you saw. Right. I, be, I saw something going online the other day, and I cannot remember this doctor's name, but she was explaining the history of, talking about what you're talking about, the Bible and freedom and things being taken out of, because obviously in slavery, the, the masters didn't want the black community or black people to understand the realness of Jesus came to set them right. free. Right. And so if they ever come to that, that understanding, then they'd be like, well, then what, what is going on here? So they yeah. took that out. And then I, I even heard that, that at night that, that slaves would take wet quilts, go into the woods, round them around some trees because wet quilts dead noise because their style of worship was was dancing and singing yeah. and if they were caught mm. they would get 200 lashes on their back mm. for praying to god because they weren't they they mm. weren't they didn't have a soul they were considered not having a soul yeah. and so uh, me being worship is something very dear to my heart when i began to even understand um, that they would go in in secret Jesus. worship and 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 wow. sing and if they really knew that they were free yeah then it would change the trajectory. And I don't, as a, as a history, as a white person, they were like, we don't want that to happen because we will lose the power. We will lose everything we have. It's horrible. And even understanding cultures of why, why even black culture and white culture and Hispanic culture, worship styles are so different, but it be, it's become of their origin of who they are. And I think a lot of times, I'm thankful for a church that we embrace a lot of styles of music. We, 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 I'm one, like, you, if you roll in my car and I play it on Spotify, there's some Tasha Cobb's gospel. Like, I, I'm a, I love that style of music. What they were, they were discussing about too many times even churches can try to put a hindrance down on styles of worship right. yes. because of afraid of something different. Yep. And I'm thankful that we're a church that we don't do that, that we, we embrace all types of worship styles. And, and I think our stage shows that. But I love the fact of what you said talking about that in scripture because the, the freedom and understanding that we believe that it's our second value that we hold dear even yeah. in this church that we want people to know God we want them to find freedom yeah. that that's the ultimate goal because once they do that this is the whole thing about exodus you, and Lord. people getting out of slavery Absolutely. that okay so we got them out of slavery but now we also have to set them free we've that's got right. to get mm -hmm. slavery out of them mm -hmm. and there's some yeah. things that we've got to work in mm -hmm. as the white people as black people as mexican people as you name it there's things and perspectives things that's got to change because they kept hoping they could go back to what they had which was slavery what again it that what they knew they couldn't see the promised land and so so good, Nate. That, that's where I think us as a church and, and as a community, we want to push that forward because we're all meant. The thief's going to try to steal, kill, and destroy your life. And that's exactly what he's trying to do. But Jesus, if he came to give us life and life to the full, then how do we embrace that? It's by finding freedom from what's been going on. Mm -hmm. Well, someone said, first of all, very, very well said, Nate. Thank you for that. And, and I think the whole racism thing... Uh, I think it was Morgan Freeman, I heard him say, you know, if you could stop calling me a black man and I stop calling you a white man, then we could maybe deal with this racism thing. I was at the grocery store the other day and I, the checker, I always speak to them, they speak to me, and I said, do you know Kendall? 
And she said, Kendall. I said, yeah, she's tall. <laughs> oh, yeah, Kendall Henson. I said, yeah, that's her. But I, I found myself being very conscious. Not, you know the black girl, Kendall. Right. right. That's just my... I, I, there was a professor here at A&M years ago who said, I long for the day that I'm recognized as, and he said his name, not the black professor and said his name. You know, and one of the things that, you know, as we continue to educate ourselves, to use the term I'm colorblind, it's pretty shallow. Very it's an insult. It's an insult. To God. Too. It's an insult to God. I don't see color. Don't, that's, that's, that is, it's an insult to God. You should be able to see color totally and celebrate. Celebrate right. it. I see you. I see that we are yes. different, but yet we are the same. Yep. Yes. And so uh, I want to free anyone up listening that if, if that has become a part of your your vernacular of what you talk about of I don't see color and I'm colorblind. Yep. Yep. We got to work at eliminating that from our vocabulary and how we operate. Is that no? I do see your color. I value it. Yep. Right? It. Ha you have mm -hmm. great dignity. You're amazing. I celebrate your color. I yep. celebrate our differences, yes. which will allow me to celebrate, celebrate where we are so similar. Completely. Right? right? Because we all have a soul, and, and that soul needs to be brought under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and that has no color. Absolutely. Right? Your mind, your will, your emotions. Yes. And so, at the end of the day, I want to celebrate you. I don't want to say, ooh, you're different, and therefore we can't be friends or anything like that. Right, so, right. to say anything like that is pretty shallow. Well, and I'm going to tag on that. It kind of goes back to speaking up for someone when they're not there, in the app, the, you know, loyal in the absent. Mm -hmm. um, someone was texting me this week. It was a family member. We're talking about something, asking how it went last weekend. I said it went great. You know, I thought, thought we made some progress and all that on our subject on racism. And then their response was, says, you know, we just got to get to the place that, you know, God doesn't see color. He looks at the heart. Now I have a choice That's right. Right. to either just say, okay, or stand up. Mm -hmm. right. So I text back and I said, I know what you're saying. I know you mean well, because I know you very well. Mm -hmm. So has, this is not a, a, a character right. assassination here, right. but just know, don't ever say to a person of color or anyone else but especially a person of color, that God doesn't see color, that's the biggest insult yep. you could give. And I explained that, yep. and I talked for a minute, and they didn't respond to my text after that. That was it. <laughs> but, I, but I felt Amen. like, the, number one is I need to educate people. Absolutely. If we don't talk about it, how are we going to educate people? Because some people are just naive. They don't know. But just bring in clarity. I wasn't judging someone. I wasn't trying to throw them under the bus. Right. I said, you need to understand. I, they happen to live in a county where 1% of their county is white. I'm sorry, is black. The 99% all white. I said, well, I have a church right. that's totally different than that. I Absolutely. live in a different world, and Absolutely. you need to understand that. Well, the only way iron can sharpen but, iron is by friction. friction. Yes. And so you got to be willing. What we're doing right now, have conversation. Is it going to be uncomfortable? Yeah, but we got to be okay with okay. uncomfortable. So let me add, you got something you want to say there? I was just going to say real quick. I said that, you know, the first step was we're all equal. Right, Brown v. Right. Brown v. Board of Education. We're not, you know, we're not separate, but we're equal. So, I think people kind of justify that. Okay, well, we're all the same. We're all the same. But what ends up happening is, when we say we're all the same, is we all we all melt into one color, right? So when people say that, they're trying to say, I see you just as, just like I see me, and, mm -hmm. I, and it's like, well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. If you saw me as different than you would that be bad? Right. That's the second level is where, wow. we, where we're trying to get to is, mm -hmm. it's like, well, we're all, co I'm, I'm colorblind. It's like, no, I want you to see this. Mm -hmm. I just don't want you to put something negative with this. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's good. You see that's what I'm so saying? Good. So, so good. that's a second level because the first level was we just had to be the same to go to school together, yep. to eat together, yep. to have lunch together, yep. right? But now it's like, no, we want to go get to a point to where we are in unity, which yep. means I, the, the foot is different than the head, yeah. the head is different than yes. the hands, they, all those different things. And that's what makes the body is the diversity yep. makes the body strong. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, man, this is so good, everybody. And there's, here's a statement, I want to throw it out there because it's, uh, it, it gets tension in some people's mind, and, and we're, but we're talking about it. We're that's called we're Black Lives Matter, right? <laughs> those words have, have created yes. a, a firestorm, is that yes. what it um, of, of, of controversy or right. different opinion and uh, I have to tell you you know five years ago or whatever I, when I was like well all lives matter I mean I was you know like well, I don't know 
But as I've educated myself and come to understand more, and I said it last weekend, when the fire truck comes to the neighborhood, he goes to the house that's on fire. Right. And so all that, does that mean all the houses don't matter? No, they all matter, but there's one on fire. Uh, I, yes, I would say that, you know, that anytime you pick a title or a slogan, there's going to be things with, with any of that, that 100% of the people are not going to all agree yes. right. on what they all represent. Right. If you can lay that down and just join me in a moment for a moment in saying black lives because of the tragedy of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. In fact, someone said Martin Luther King in his in, uh, until his life ended in 1968, tragically. He influenced the world to the limit of the of the media that he could that he would reach the world. Whereas George Floyd, in seconds, that story, you could not turn away from the reality and the brutality and the horror of a man's life being taken in front of the whole world. Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, I can't, I can't watch it, but, but I have to watch it. Right. I, need, I need to feel the pain right, of that. Right. Yeah. And know that how many of them are not filmed that have happened countless times. And so black lives matter. And that's why we're talking about black lives matter. Do Jewish lives or do white lives or do, you know, Japanese, they all matter. Right. Okay. They all matter. But right now we're talking about what's going on in the black community because there's been just so many decades and centuries of oppression Right. Um, and I just think that it's important we can have the boldness to bring it to the table. And we were talking a little bit about that upstairs. Uh, tell me a little bit. Talk about that a little bit, Jarvis. Um, I, I guess for me, I'm a prosecutor by trade. So, um, so you try everything from theft cases to murder cases to everything in between. If I ask, did you as kill? As a prosecutor. I'm a yes. prosecutor. Did you kill that lady? And somebody told me on the stand <laughs> Well, why are we worried about her? Don't all people's lives, I mean, why, why are we worried about this murder, right? You're not worried about any other murders out there. The jury would be like, you guilty, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? He is guilty, right? You are guilty. You are deflecting. You are guilty. It would be objection, non-responsive. Judge would say, sustain. I'm ordering you to answer the question. That would happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. There is never a problem when we have, uh, we wearing pink for breast cancer awareness, Right? You don't have right. a whole bunch to do to say, well, what about my colon cancer? Ain't nobody talking about my colon cancer. Yeah. <laughs> what about <laughs> testicular I'm cancer? Not why, about why are you going to leave? This is, this like, the truth. like they don't, the truth. We, don't, we don't do that. We when, don't the, do that. when the Twin Towers hit the buildings in, in, on 9 11, we didn't say, well, what about this thing? And what about this thing? Have you talked about this? Yeah, what about the Chrysler side? building? Yeah, what, what about, about the Chrysler other buildings? buildings? What about other all places? The, we don't do that because in that moment, we need to stand with the people in New York yes. to say NYPD yes. strong. When yes. the terrorists hit Boston yes. at the uh, Boston Marathon, we yeah. said Boston strong. There is no problem for anybody to get behind that. Right, right. I think that we have been conditioned many times to say, to, to recoil. Right. And well, let me back up. I'm going to say this right here because I'm stepping on some people's toes. Uh, we don't have any problem saying blue lives matter. I'm just going to let that let, lay right for a second because we understand what, what, what has happened to police officers in the line of duty. I've had uh, Brian Bachman was a friend of mine. Yep. Like, he was a buddy of mine. And now, for I, those of you who don't know, Brian Bachman lost his life. Lost his life. Just serving, uh, serving, serving an, a an eviction warrant. notice. A, yes. Something as simple as that. Yes. yes. We don't have a problem with that. And so we understand that. I think that what, when people say black lives matter, it is there, it is in your face. And it's what people are crying out saying, do we matter right. to you? Right. Not does everybody else matter. I get it. They, and there are problems in other places. But yes, right. I think people say, right. do, we, do you care about what's happening? And it forces people and to has say, been happening. And has been, and has been happening. Yeah. Well, when did, when did saying that one life matters disparage another right i think that's right. what a lot of times people right. are saying yeah. well if i say that life matters and that doesn't that means this yeah. life no that's yep. not what that's no, saying no, it's, it's just saying this house is on fire yep. it yeah. needs help we yeah. need to address yeah. what needs help right yes. now and i think we just really need to think before we speak because if i say 
Um, I'm a Christian, but what I'm about to say almost may negate why I'm not a Christian. Right? Yes. Mm. All lives, mm. yes, black lives matter, but you're about to say maybe why they don't. But all lives matter, or but da da da, you know, whatever you might say. So I think that we just, one, need to turn filters on. Right. Yes. Yes. What is that filter? Love. Let everything filter Absolutely. through love. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Don't yeah. let it filter through political affiliations. Don't let it filter through your color. Don't let it filter through any of those things your history, your past, how you're brought up. Let it filter through love. And if it filters through love the way it should, it may change when it comes out on the other side. Right. Yep. Because a lot of times we don't turn that filter on and you'll say, yeah, Black Lives Matter, but, okay, here comes the but, yep. right? And yep. so I think yep. if people, that comes through education, that yep. comes through conversation, yep. Yep. right? It, it comes through all of those things. But when we live in a silo of our own, me, my four, and no more, we set up, again, those prejudged notions about whether it's a person, uh, people group, whether it's a movement, whatever it is, and we automatically um, as one of my mentors used to say, perceptions make the world go round, and without communication, people grow horns. Meaning, <laughs> at the end of the day, if we don't communicate, I'm, automa I'm automatically going to think, I'm going to lean towards the worst. Yes. I'm going to think the worst about a situation yes. if we don't communicate, right? And so, but the communication is like, Ugh. that's why I've gotten 100 text messages and calls of people saying, hey, how you doing? Things like right. that. Maybe don't have all the words to say, but they're reaching out, touching. Say yep. something. Yep. But I will say this. I know people that I thought I was close to mm. who I've not heard a drop, mm. a, a text, a call. Hear that. These are people that, I'm clo that I thought Hear we were that. close. I hear that. Wow. And I'm still, like, waiting and I'm seeing. And I'm, but you know what? At the end of the day, i got to let stuff filter through love. Right. I can't let someone else's ignorance sure. change me and how so I'm going to walk things out. Because at the end of the day... I identify as a Christ follower. I don't identify black Christian. You don't have to tell me what kind of Christian I am. I'm a Christ follower. Yes. And at the end of the day, that's how I'm going to have to love people. And I want to bring people together. And sometimes bringing people together is a tough conversation, looking at you in the eye and saying, you're wrong. The way you think is wrong. You need to look in the mirror and you need to challenge how you were brought up. You, you can't ask God to adjust his will to how you want to live. Blackaby says in Experiencing God, you have to make the major adjustment in your life to line up with his will. Yeah. Yes. That's, right? all, that's all about the heart. That's a heart issue. Heart. I might be getting ahead of myself, but that's a heart issue. No, that's good. At that, the end of the day. So the Black Lives Matter movement, it's not a but. No. But don't these? Black Lives Matter. But. No. Black. Period. And until you can see that period, until right. you can add a period to it, it won't mean to you what it should mean to you. Yeah. Right. If it's always a comma, yep. or there's a comma but with a conjunction, until it's a period or an exclamation point, it won't mean what it's supposed to mean to you. Yeah. Can I just add one thing you said? As a Christian, our call is to bear one another's burdens, mm. right? I think it's in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, love bears all things, right? Believes all things. We're supposed to bear each other's burdens. So this is a burden right yep. here. Yeah. This is a burden. Now... Many times when we bear a burden, if you have somebody that's walking and they have a burden on them, you have to come up beside them, come beside them. and lift, help lift that load. Yes, right? If they right. got a limp, we got to figure out what's going on. What's, what's the reason on? for the limp? Right. Right. What do we right. need to do? What, right. what's, what is happening that got us to this point so we can get across this finish line? This is part of it right here. Yeah. And it is, it, you're right, it's not at the expense of anything else, but as Christians, we're called, I think, to push past the noise and say, okay, here's the problem. Here's, problem. here's this person is my, this is person, my friend, this person is my brother. My brother. Yeah. So we're going to walk through, we're going to walk in this right. together. Well, and sympathy is different than empathy. Yes. I can feel sorry for you. Mm -hmm. like, I'm so sorry that that happened. And I can turn around and live my life like nothing's checked because it hasn't mm -hmm. affected me. Yes. But if I truly care for you, mm -hmm. then I can empathize and say, I'm sorry. And I'm going to sit here with you in your pain and yes. say, I, 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 I didn't, it didn't happen to me, but I'm going to sit here with you yes. and walk this journey yes. with you. Yes. And that's what we as the body of Christ have yes. to do. Yep. And I think that Jesus, this is exactly what Jesus did. The reason why Jesus could stand up and proclaim yep. certain things is because he sat down with people mm -hmm. before he stood up with them. Yes. Yep. 
And because he could stand up with them, it's because he sat down and, and had time with them. And people who were downtrodden. People who, the lowest. Yeah, they they the, the were people. devalued. Yes. They, they were looked down upon. He touched a leper that, that you're supposed to walk in saying, unclean, unclean. Yes. He yes. touched him. Like, this is what, and, and yet as a Christian, you said this last Sunday, Pastor, that a oh quote God. from Pastor oh Mike Hayes, you can't be a Christian and be a racist. Right. You can't. Jesus, I mean, even Jesus was ridiculed by religious people Think about yes. it. So because yeah. he gave value to people who people are like, oh, we, this isn't socially acceptable, Jesus. We, we don't do this. This isn't how things play out. And he's like, no, this is how. And I'm here to change all that. And I'm going yeah. to walk with people. Mm -hmm. And you ain't going to like it. Guess what? Because I came for the sinner. I came for the people who didn't feel valued. Right. I came for the people who were looked. That's who I died on the cross for. And so I can have empathy yeah. and I can sit with them. And that's what we as a body of Christ have to do. And I think, no, we're not. Uh, unity and uniformity are two different things. Right. Yes. We can, like, we, we're going to disagree on certain things because right. of perspective, life experience, yeah. the way we were raised. But we can still sit here in agreement like we're doing here today yeah. and say, you know what? I may not fully understand, but I love you enough that I'm going to sit here and I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try. And I'm going to listen. And I'm going to hear you out. And I'm going to go, okay, I, 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 see, I see you and I see the pain. Now let's, let's walk this together. Yep. That's what Jesus did, and that's what we And did. Jesus changed the heart of the oppressor. He sure did. Yes. You look at Zacchaeus, Luke mm -hmm. chapter 19, mm -hmm. right? He had robbed people as a chief tax collector, yep. Yep. right? And when Jesus said, I must come to your house, come, Zacchaeus. Come down from the tree, let's go. Everyone started grumbling, saying, hold on, he's going to eat with him? He I robbed mean, me. Yeah. He robbed me. And from the jump, Zacchaeus said, I'll give away half of my wealth to the poor, and I will pay back all those I cheated, and four, four, four times as much. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And so he's not, he, yes, the oppressed. You see that all through scripture, right? But the oppressor, and when the oppressor gets set free, free indeed, free indeed. Absolutely. they have a, a, a reach to be able to touch people that Absolutely. they wronged. Yep. Their heart does a 180 for the Lord, yes, oftentimes, right. Yes, right. you look at the Saul, Paul, the 180 happens, and then they start winning people for Christ, and lives are affected. So the oppressed, yes. The oppressor, yes. He is wanting to change the hearts of all men to line up and come Thank under the lordship Jesus. of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. When yeah. you talk about the, uh, when you were saying that, it's like the oppressor was moved to action. Yeah. It wasn't just, oh, I had a heart, I had a heart change, right? It was, I was moved to action. That's right. So and here, that's, that's So here we sit. Yes. He, here we sit. Because uh, in my role as a pastor and leading people, I can't sit by and, and do nothing. Right. Can I change the whole world? Well, I don't know. But I know what I can change. I've started my house. Right. So what can we do? What are, our, what are our next steps, right? Where do we go from here? We need right. a new direction. Right, right. That, that's what repentance means. It means, uh, it means an about faith. In other words, I got to turn and go a different direction. That's right. I get my thinking. And that's what this conversation today, the intention of it is, is to help in, in our world right here, doing what we can to talk about the sin of racism. And I want to urge you, to talk about it around your kitchen table, talk about it in your living room, talk about it when you're riding in the car with your children, with your friends. And not, I don't mean in a wrong way, I mean in a helpful, like, like what does it mean to love other people? Right. What, what, since when? I remember when Nathan, Pastor Nate's 31 now, but when he was a baby, and Nana Jew, and many of you know the story, Nana Jew, of course, had Nathan, <laughs> took care of him since he was two weeks old. And there came a time she told us a story after church one day, and I don't know, he had to be old enough to communicate a little bit and recognize, so he was several months old, but she has him in church, and he, he starts scratching on her arm. And she had that beautiful, beautiful brown skin. I mean, her skin was just flawless. And he scratched her, and she said after church, you know, he's just kind of looking, he couldn't say it, he couldn't verbalize, but he, he recognized the pigment of her skin was different. But then that was all there was to it because right. before the pigment was recognized, he felt the love, the embrace, the care, the grandmother, he, what we're really all about. Yeah. So 
he's grown up in this world of we are God's children. And, and so I'll just say that, what do we do? First of all, speak up. Start talking about this. Have conversations with your family, with your friends. Secondly, I would say be intentional to learn and listen, as we've been talking about today. Another thing we can do is, is um, don't stereotype. Since when did skin color, you said this the other day to me, when, since when did skin color become a presumption of guilt or innocence? For so many times, instantly, when these interactions happen, um, and this is not just pol police, but just in, in general, many times skin color becomes a um, a a part or a evidence of criminality or evidence of innocence and i think that for for many people i told a story about when um when i was an 18 and i was in the in the mall and i'm i'm walking we're trying to go to get some clothes and i'm on a, I'm at a debate tournament in st mm -hmm. louis and the the, guy, the, the police officer followed me through multiple stores and I said uh, I finally got the courage to say why are you following me and he looked at me just like I'm looking at you and he said because you're going to steal right and I'm in St. Louis, Missouri so I'm not from there he's never seen me before never met me before anything like that and I could tell you I felt mad in that situation but what I felt was helplessness I mean if I'm really being honest I felt like I, there was nothing that I could do to to, to, to change his, his, his yeah. thought process. And so I feel like um, having those conversations, I've had more conversations with random different people that I've known about race and what they can do after George Floyd than I've ever had right. in my entire life. I said, my doctor stopped me and I went in and he just, he, he came in, he said, I saw what you wrote and he just started tearing up. And uh, I had a guy at the tennis court, Aaron plays tennis, and he started asking me, there, this is the opening for conversations yeah. to see how we can, right. we can come together and bear one another's burdens. Right. I remember you talking about Nana Jew and her skin and me trying to, I'm trying to understand it all. I, we talked about this in that, the conversation we had a couple weeks ago, but I had a personal experience even with Nana Jew in sixth grade when oh. she was dropping me off mm -hmm. at school. Nana, for those that don't know, Nana, she took me to school. She picked me up. We'd go to the convenience store on the way home, get a ice cream Snickers bar. Like, it was, a, it was a tradition. This is what we did. And she was rolling up in her 93 Honda Civic every day, white Honda Civic. And she would drop me off at, my, at middle school. And I started getting a lot of questions because, obviously, she's black, I'm white. But I had a lot of people asking me, who is that? Who is this lady dropping you off? And as a white person, I, I didn't know there was something wrong until that question got asked. And I, as an 11 year old, I'm trying to figure out, oh, what do I say? Yeah. What, what should my response be in this moment? Right. Talking about judging and, 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 and trying to stereotype. And I'm like, I understand enough to know that this is unique, but what, what, what do I say? Yeah. And so I started telling Nana, this is, this is my own personal experience. I said, Nana, when you take me to school now, will you drop me off at the school bus? Because I got tired of getting asked the question because I would avoid the question. When you pick me up, pick me up at the corner on the school bus because I, I, or the, the bus stop, because people are asking me questions and I don't know what to tell them. And she looked at me in my eye, if you know Nana Ju, you know anything about her. She looked me straight in my eye and she said, well, what are they asking? I said, they're asking who you are and I don't know what to tell them. She goes, who am I to you, baby? I said, yeah. You're my grandma. Huh. And she said, well, then tell them that. Yep. That's all they need to know. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so the next day, literally, because she had just picked me up from school, the next day I rolled in. I said, drop me off at the front. Because all your friends, you know, they're waiting for you in middle school. <laughs> ain't got nothing else better to do. <laughs> so we roll up to the front. And used to, I'd sit with my, my chair. I'd have it leaning back a little bit. Just, you know, I called it because I was just trying to be cool, you know. But I... But in my, I didn't know what to do. I had my chair sitting up. We talked. We had a great conversation. And I said, I, I love you, Nana. I got out the door. And those same friends, black and white, had both. They said, who, who is this lady? I said, y'all keep asking me this question. She's my grandma. And they looked at me and I said, you got a black grandma? <laughs> I said, yes, I do. And, but it was an experience for me that I had to walk through to come to the understanding that, that 
the love that we had for each other didn't right. it wasn't barriered or put up a wall because of the color of our skin it was because of who she was to me about and, relationship. and about relationship and i think that talking about speaking yeah. up that was my first instance to go there's nothing wrong with that and why are, why is it even in question it shouldn't be a problem and yet right. coming to that and so i think having the conversation there was something that i saw it's called take the risk and r-i-s-k is is an acronym r standing for relationship who are you in relationship with and who you are in relationship with, you need to talk, yes. have conversation. Yeah. I is intentional. You got to be intentional. Who are you surrounding yourself with? If you're only surrounding yourself with white people, you need some more color and you rainbow some, in your yeah. group like you do yes. yeah. because you need to embrace the different cultures that are in this world. S means to speak up and stand up. Means when you're in conversations, like you just said, have moments. And K means knowledge. Educate yourself. Get information. Come to an understanding. Because if you don't, you're going to live with this perception that is completely off. And you'll never be able to have true empathy with people. You only will sympathize. Well, I'm sorry you lost that person and I can walk away. No, I'm sorry you lost. And let me sit here with you What during that. So I think that's what we have to do. Those are some steps that I think we need to take. Can I just add something to that? So... I want to talk just real quickly, and hopefully it doesn't come out the wrong way. I want to talk to um, to the white people out there who are like, okay, I don't know what just happened. Um, I don't, I don't know how to fix this. Like what? Like I just, I've heard a lot of stuff here. This may be really sharp. I want to say a couple of things. What you saw today, and I talked to you about this um, the, the last time we spoke, was we're about to take off a mask right. that we wear on a regular basis. Yeah. And you're about to hear what's in our heart that we don't talk about when you say, how are things going? Right. Right? And so we don't talk about a lot of this stuff because if we told you about how it was, it may scare some people. Right. Yeah. Right? What I would say is there is grace so right good. now in so this good. conversation on both sides of the aisle. So, good. so find, like you said, find somebody you're in a relationship with and then start asking just ask some questions and ask for grace because God will honor that. Yes. That's right. It goes so far. I had so many friends who were white that just reached out to me and said, I don't know what to do right now, but I just want to see how you're doing and if you're okay. And I didn't realize at the time that I wasn't okay, but I was so thankful that they reached out because it provided me a chance to just talk to them about what was going on in my life and what has gone on in, my, in a lot of our lives for a long time. What I would say is that your Thank black you, friends wear a mask and it's okay to set, to ask them how they're doing and to have them talk to so you good. about that. So you can see what that burden is and then walk with them through that. One so. hurt with those who are hurting. And I saw something a couple weeks ago when a member of this church hugged my wife, no words were said. And my wife was able to cry and she hugged my wife and they just embraced. The healing takes place in the lamenting and hurting with people, right. not coming up with a solution, not rushing to an answer uh, to try to you know, make yourself feel good. Or what can we do? How about just sit? Some of the best healing is not in words. The best comfort rather is not in words. The best comfort is in just sitting. And then when the conversation does take place, having ears to hear and listen and not a loaded mouth to, to rebut or answer. Thank you, Jesus. To just listen. Thank you, There's Jesus. healing in that on Thank all Jesus. sides. Thank you, Jesus. I really feel this right here is that, you know, there are moments in life and there are moments and I really feel that Skybreak is positioned for has been positioned for this moment right here. Skybreak Church is positioned for this moment. People are looking to Skybreak Church how how we how do you do what you do right now? And sometimes it takes things that you would never think, tragedies or whatever. You know, people come to church all the time when there's a tragedy, but people are looking to to wait a minute, what is it that we have here in this church? And so that is a call, not just for you. It's a call for everybody out here that they're looking to us to be the church. And what that means in 2020 
in the United States of America. They are looking to us to see what is, what is loving our neighbor, what is loving Jesus mean right now. And we are the embodiment of that. And it's gonna take steps and work and conversations and risk and, and hurt and, and, and getting it wrong. But there's grace in all of that. And 30 years ago, God knew that this was gonna happen. They knew that this was gonna happen. And so you are in a skybreak moment that is, that people are looking. I had a, a prosecutor in my office and he's a, he's a believer. He said, what do y'all do over there? Do y'all have some resources or something, something that y'all wrote because y'all have a diverse church. I was like, we ain't got nothing. I'm like, I don't think we have any resources. We don't have any books or nothing. But you he can't was, legislate this. You, yeah, you're, you're exactly it has right. To you be, it has to be who you it are. It has to be organic. But it is intentional from the stage. Yes, it, it is. Intentional it's intentional from the leadership that yes. we're going to be yes. diverse in the church. And people are wondering, how can we get along? People are asking that question right now. Yep. And it is up to us to show, to walk this out. And so you are, you are lucky to be in a church like this. At the same time, it is a calling. It is a, it is a charge to keep, right? That yep, this is yep. our duty so that we become the church to the world. And I want to tell you and you and the leadership of the church publicly that we stand with you. Yep. You're my pastor. You're in leadership yes. over our lives. We submit to your leadership as you submit to Christ. Yes. And I've told you this privately and I'll tell you publicly, I'll fight for you. Not just with these, but I will fight for you in prayer, yes. in your family. What, you're leading this church, but you have situations at home. We pray for you, but we stand with you, especially in this issue, because we see your heart. And if anyone ever questions the heart of my pastor, or my leadership of my church, they have an instant issue with me. And I will, trust me when I say it, and those who know me, I will say something. I'm not afraid of the tough conversations. And so I love you, and uh, you're my pastor. And as you follow Christ, we'll follow you. And there's growth pains along the way, and we continue to tweak and chisel and sand, but that's a part of sanctification. And so I love you. Thank you. And I mean that with all my heart. Love Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I receive it. And I feel it and I believe it. I know Pastor Nate as well. So on Thursday, this past Thursday, I met at the College Station Police Department. I was invited. Both of our police chiefs, Ryan and College Station, and their top brass, their top leaders, but eight of them, were meeting again this Thursday. And I was so proud of one young man I'll let you in on a little story same age as our son Jared Green back here on the keyboard 36 year old young man and he said I grew up in this town and he knew both of the police chiefs well and uh, but he said I, he's now and his life's been on a roller coaster he was, he, he was raised and made a lot of mistakes and paid for it but he said I'm, I don't want my kids I don't want what's happening in our nation to come to our city, and I don't want my kids to be exposed. I want, I, we, I want them to love our cops. I want them to have a relationship, to know that you're not the enemy. And, and I mean, it, 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 and I just sat there, look, I wanted to hug this young man. In fact, I did. I mean, COVID, you know, you're trying to be six feet apart, but I just, I just met him on Thursday morning, and I just had to hug him. That's because I could be his dad, you know? And I heard his heart. He's had a God change. Listen, I have it in my notes. Don't underestimate the God factor in all of this, right? And this young man has come to Jesus. He spent 10 years in the penitentiary. He's 36 years old and five children. And he's back in the community. He's working and he's got a great job and he's building his life. And I'm like, yes, man, this is the champion of the cause right here. And so he, but he's, he sat there, you know, with his heart open, like, I want this to work. And so we meet next week on Thursday morning with the police chiefs again. Both police chiefs sought me out afterward. And what you just said, I've watched it happen. Because they're like, you might, they didn't say it, but I know they're looking at me because they're all white. Like, like white, white, the police chiefs. 
I met them both, talked to them both. They gave me their cell number and said, we need to talk. So this is our moment. We cannot miss it, and we will not miss it because we've been doing this. All. It's not something new for us, but it's something we can do better. And, and so you can't push some doors down, and now this is an opportunity. The conversation's being had. Let's walk through the door. God, take away our excuses. Take away our complaints. Take away all of our prejudices. Take away all of our profiling. Take away, take away racism. I come to you, God, right now in the name of Jesus. Let healing happen in this place today. Let it happen in my heart, in every heart. Healing, unity, forgiveness, grace. Let it happen in our nation. Oh, God, this nation needs you. This world, our world needs you. And I declare healing right now in the name of the Lord. God, let something that we've said today be seed, good seed. Let it find good soil in the hearts of men and women to say we are God's people. One family, many colors, many diversities, the beauty of it all. God, we celebrate that. We welcome that. Help us to understand that you came to save every one of us. Take our brokenness and our pain and wash us in your grace and in your love right now. Give us a fresh new love one for another. As was said here today, to feel what my brother and my sister feels, to empathize, to to walk in the pain of each other, to take a moment and carry one another, to come alongside and bear each other's burdens, Father. We turn our hearts to you, Jesus. Thank you that you are our hope and that you have come to give us life to the full. We declare war on the enemy not my brother, not another person, but on the devil who is trying to divide and tear down. We declare war on him in the name of Jesus. He is the thief. He is the one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But you come to bring life. So we turn to you, God. I ask you to help us, guide us, comfort this nation, comfort the brokenhearted, and help us to have answers but before we have answers help us to have love in the name of Jesus I pray in the name of Jesus I pray we pray together to God be the glory amen and amen and amen thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you God bless you